everyone. I'm Luben Pampulov, co-founder and partner at GSV. I'm here um, to discuss innovation around the world, uh, some of the mega trends happening in different places, China, Brazil, Africa, US, and so forth. Uh, I'm joined by four specialists, Alejandro Caballero from uh, the IFC, uh, the investment arm of the World Bank, uh, Rodrigo Salvador, CEO and founder of Passe Diretto, uh, Brazil's largest education platform for college students, Jack Huang from Langsam, one of the largest education companies in China, 2.8 billion market cap, uh, I believe 150 million of revenue growing at 50%, um, and then Michael Staten, partner at Learn Capital, one of the most active VC funds in early stage uh, education. Um, the one thing that um, education has lacked uh, so far is some big disruptive ideas that are transforming uh, segments of the education market in rapid uh, speed. So comparing, for example, looking at the ride-sharing economy for the last eight years, you suddenly had this big company, Uber, that came in, disrupted taxi, the taxi industry very quickly. Um, today, the ride-sharing economy, you know, including Lyft and Didi and some of the other major players, is uh, going to be a 45 billion industry uh, by the end of this year. Uh, meanwhile, the taxi, and growing extremely fast, meanwhile, the taxi industry um, is a $50 billion industry have not grown at all over the past 20 or so years. Same thing uh, with the hotel industry. Airbnb very quickly has made tremendous progress and is starting to, to become a significant chunk of, of the hotel industry. Um, and then another example that I love is WhatsApp with its uh, 48 employees which managed to disrupt uh, telecommunication and the entire SMS industry. Um, but the one thing that we are still lacking to see in education is really having these huge examples of companies that uh, be, you know, make very significant impact. Um, so that's one of the things I want to discuss today, kind of looking at what are some innovative forces happening in different places around the world. Can we expect some of those um, big disruptive companies and trends and uh, what should we be focused on? So, uh, Jake, I want to start with you. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about Langsum and um, how have you come to where you are today? What are some of the things you've done in terms of uh, innovation? And also, where do you think you're going over the next couple of years? Oh, thank you, Lumen. Uh, so, Langsum is a public company. You know, we went public about nine years ago. But the company really started like, you know, over like 20 years ago by a bunch of, uh, you know, graduates from Tsinghua. They were students and they were studying, uh, uh, you know, something really humble and small, you know, on the Cambridge in the year 1987, 1886. They started a very small, you know, coffee shop into providing the sort of coffee, zero machine, you know, service to, or, you know, uh, the students on the campus. And so this, we had a really, really uh, small beginning, humble beginning, and evolved all the way to become, you know, the largest uh, provider in terms of providing uh, comprehensive, information uh, security solution, you know, that was before, you know, uh, like uh, 2013. So in the year 2013, we decided to enter into a new market, that is education. So um, in the past four, three years. And, and know, why was that? And, you know, I mean, it's basically we want to go to our, a market that is uh, bigger and, uh, and, and the ceiling actually higher than the, uh, you know, information security industry, you know, that was, you know, so we were the largest already by that time, you know, as the uh, leading provider providing the solution, you know, to or the marketplace in China, you know, by the year, you know, 2013. So we decided to do something new, you mm -hmm. know, rather than just, you know, sticking everything, you know, to our one industry. So that is also depending on our understanding, the nature of education that, you know, it's, it's a mass market and a lot of money actually going into or pouring into our education market from the government, from the Chinese families. And uh, so um, it's also a good fit for the culture of the company, you know, we, because we are committed to or, you know, solving big problems, all right? You know, so bigger than just information security. Right? So we decided to go into our education. So basically we, uh, through our organic growth and merger acquisition, we have accumulated, you know, really sensible you know, assets in uh, K-12 and in professional, you know, uh, 
uh, education in both space. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the other question is is great, you know, in terms of the reason why you know we become one of the largest, you know, uh, so far, is that you know China is very big, with a really uh, big population, so the market is very big. So we follow the very big market. Uh, another thing actually is we follow the very very big problems. We are hoping to. Uh, so in order to build a sustainable and a sizable business, you have to follow the big problems. And also we have to follow the money, where the money actually are, so for the, where the mon money goes. So by doing that, we design our B2B business model at the same time design the B2C model. So uh, the money for, for the B2B, the money coming from basically the Chinese government. So for example, the Chinese government spending every year you know, on informationization projects that is to help you know, different level schools to modernize its lending infrastructure. So every year expenditure is more than 300 billion you know, RMB. Mm -hmm. So that is something big. All right. So even have, if you, you get a very small piece of pie, you, you, you make, actually make a very, very sizable business. And on the B2C part, you know, that relates to the, uh, the social restructure you know, of China because the middle class families are getting bigger and bigger, they have much more higher disposable income, they want to you know, they want to buy better in you know, education, they want to send their children for to go to the best possible schools, they send them to go to the United States to study and so on. So we call that the upgrade in terms of uh, the middle class uh, education consumption. So that is really big force in terms of pushing up, you know, the uh, the whole education spending, you know, by the middle class families. You know, middle class families actually is the uh, driver for B2C consumption in China for almost everything. And we also follow another thing, you know, we follow the talent, you know, we follow, you know, to be romantic, we follow our hearts, <laughs> all right? But, you know, you could interpret that into, a, in, if you interpret that in a romantic way, you basically take your business into trouble. So by seeing that, I mean, you know, we, we follow our sort of purpose. So we want to, we want to do something, you know, really with a purpose. That is to, you know, uh, basically to fill the gap between what exactly the market needs and what actually is not provided by the public school system. Mm -hmm. So that's where we think we fit in and mm -hmm. we can get big. Okay. And another question on China, and maybe Michael or Alejandro can uh, also comment on that. Uh, what is currently? What are currently the education companies in China looking like? Are they more like copycats, or are there some original ideas that you guys are seeing? <laughs> because traditionally, it's been mostly you know taking ideas from Silicon Valley and then you know putting them basically yeah. in the Chinese market just because there is such a need and it doesn't exist. But are yeah, you seeing I some mean, change? Well, you, maybe you should go. I mean, I can talk about, I mean, some of ex some examples maybe on the math online learning. No, I mean, initially there were a number number of models that were uh, not that different from Khan Academy in the beginning, but they they have grown little by little into more homegrown type of models. They've added some specific uh, adaptability features, adaptive learning type of capabilities. They've diversified into assessments and, 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 and so on and so forth. So I think... I mean, more and more the models are homegrown and are trying to to respond to the actual needs of the of the market. I mean, I see a huge need in in, in China for for supplemental education, as as it was mentioned. I mean, middle class is expanding. I mean, historically there was the one child policy that made that all the beds of one family were put into into a single child, and that that also brought a lot of disposable income going into things that have to do with direct education provision, but also the supplemental uh, services that go around it, like test preparation, uh, language learning, tutoring, after school tutoring, and so on and, and, and so forth. I think these are areas where the models are becoming increasingly homegrown and not so much uh, copycat. And, and definitely, I, I don't know, I was talking to some companies here at the, at the event, I mean, VIP Kids, for instance, which is a, a very interesting English, ling English language teaching that leverages uh, teaching resources from the US. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very interesting model with potential for tier two and tier three cities, which, which is also one of the huge needs in, in China. No? I mean, the huge disparities between the coastal areas and, and mainland China and how some of these models are actually trying to bring the resources to, to those areas where the need is, is greatest. Yep. Um, uh, uh, 
we, we do get um, quite a bit of deal flow from China, but I wouldn't say that we in any way uh, you know, have the whole market covered, um, though we do have a couple firms that we uh, talk to pretty frequently. Um, uh, I think that you know, what I've seen is, uh, you know, sometimes I think about uh, education products as either being what I call a precision product or a whole solution. And a precision product is doing something really, really, really narrow and hopes to get wide adoption very quickly. And a whole solution is trying to kind of like solve a, an interrelated set of problems. And generally, there's a sales model, right? Um, and so, for instance, Edmodo, which is uh, in our portfolio, uh, which is kind of the most massive K-12 uh, social network, uh, uh, started out as really a precision product, right? And got wide teacher adoption. Um, and uh, we met uh, quite a while ago, met with uh, Ichi Zoye or Yao Chi Zoye, um, the uh, 17 homework. Uh, and it, it had much more of a whole solution and was getting a lot of, of, of traction with selling that whole solution, doing enterprise sales, uh, kind of door to door, city to city. Um, and they were investing in their sales force quite heavily. So, um, you know, it seems like there's a preference towards whole solutions. And then, you know, as Jack was mentioning, uh, this, this idea of, of parents being willing to spend quite a bit of their discretionary income on opportunities for their kids really changes the landscape a little bit. In the US, you tend to see things that are like just good enough. And sometimes you're even surprised that it's, it is good enough because it looks like it might not be. Um, whereas, uh, you know, in China, we tend to see people, parents want to pay more for more, right? And so, uh, and, and they tend to want human services, you know, VIP kids doing real, very well. Um, but there, it, I mean, that is like person to person. It is one-on-one -on -one tutoring, uh, which is what a lot of parents want. And so I don't necessarily see copycats. Things may, might start out uh, being inspired by, you know, something they saw that's working uh, elsewhere. But then they tend to adapt it pretty quickly to the Chinese context is probably what I'd say. May I add a couple of points? Sure. Yeah. I think you know I've been uh, working in the international education sector for as long as 18 years. So I see, you know, education is truly global business with a lot of uh, very dra dramatic regional differences. So I've been traveling between China and USA. So I see, you know, the two actual marketplace mar markets are uh, getting increasingly, uh, you know, alike, but at the same time increasingly different. And from the business model perspective, I think you know this copy to China business model still works. So there are things that we can, we can borrow, you know, we can make reference to, and we can basically copy that to China. But rather than doing the copycat way, you know, sort of a, a, you know the primitive way, and so I think the two markets are are lending, you know, each other. That's why you know this year, you know, we have we are having this uh, largest, you know, uh, a group from China, and basically trying to making the connection between the two largest, you know, education market, the U.S. and China. So there's a lot of things that we can learn from each other. But uh, if you look at the uh, market very, um, at the very close manner, the markets are very, works fundamentally different, but at the same time, fundamentally alike. Yeah, yeah. yeah so very interesting like paradox. It seems like there's also a little bit of difference in the culture and the mindset of Americans versus Chinese, and obviously that's reflected in you know income spent on on, on education in China yeah. is so much bigger than in the U.S. And then you look at different things like income spent on transportation and housing yeah. is much much bigger in the U.S. And so according just to our survey, you know, visually the number one expenditure in China for middle class families first is housing. Housing getting really crazy in China, but second one is education. But here, probably the same. You know, the middle class families spend a lot of money on education. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have a funny joke. Uh, I was at a, a venture summit in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, and uh, there was an anecdote that a venture capitalist was asking a kind of copycat business, aren't you worried about copyright? And they're like, no, we're worried about copying right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Shifting to Rodrigo and to Brazil. All so right. Brazil is the second largest for-profit market, education market in the world after the US. Uh, obviously currently going through a very difficult time uh, politically and economically. Seems like there's going to be a new president soon. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about how is this affecting the education space? How is it affecting you? What are you trying to do with Posei Di Reto? Got it. So thanks a lot, Luben. I mean, um, what can you say about a country whose president has been impeached? Like, you can't have a more unstable scenario than that. And 
Yes, there are many problems, but there are many, many opportunities with that. I mean, um, this same government, which is now having a really hard time with the economy, was this government um, that in 2000, we had 3 million college students. 10 years later, we doubled. There were 6 million. So they invested a lot in education. But however, there was a lot of debt for the students, and many of them weren't able to pay their colleges and had to leave. Um, so we're seeing a lot of opportunities, and in Passage Direto, we have 5.5 million users in Brazil. Uh, 4.5 million of those are college students out of a 7 million um, college student population. It's pretty good. So, yeah. so it's almost 90 percent of the college population. So yeah, yeah. And, and, and what's it's a Microsoft of college students. <laughs> <laughs> and what's fun is that, um, so I wanted to focus more on the college market more than education in general because it's my market and it's the one that's <laughs> being mostly affected. So we can see the college students from day one to the day he get, graduates and until the time he gets a job. So we can see the whole um, student cycle. And it's very clear they have opportunity everywhere. Like it, it's getting harder to go to college. So we're seeing a lot of startups having immense growth in student loans and scholarships. Um, it's getting harder to study. So um, the big groups, Krot and Stasio, Somos, billion dollar companies, um, their major KPI now is um, to reduce the dropout rate. Mm -hmm. That's what they're focusing at. Um, and to get a job, um, Brazil, in the last 10 years, we're the first time where we're having more jobs closed than jobs opened. So we're having college students that are having a hard time even to enter college, to finish college, and to find a job. So there's basically opportunity everywhere, and I see this in a very optimistic way. I see that um, your competitors, they aren't efficient. They will be out of business. Um, new solutions will come online, cheaper better price and better business models. Um, so I see a perfect time for startups and disruption in the Brazilian education market right now. And Passei Direct is not only in Brazil, it, you've only expanded internationally, correct? Uh, so this is funny. Um, we have over 3 million unique visitors every year, last year at least, um, coming to Passei Direct, over 4.5 million visits, um, but it's only in Portuguese. So the guys can't actually use the product um, and there's no marketing, it's only Portuguese, no easy way. So we're seeing huge demand um, of students from other countries to get the study materials that our users shared collaboratively. We have over one million um, study materials. It's like sharing economy, like students help each other for free. Um, and, but we're still not going internationally. That's for next year. Okay. Still Brazil. Yeah. I think that story basically underpinning a universal sort of, a, you know, a sort of common common issue shared by you know every single market you know for professional education is all about helping you know the young college students or young professionals getting jobs mm -hmm. all right so finding a job actually is really truly universal but the way how we help them is different and vary from market to market but again we are tackling a universal problem yeah yeah Alejandro uh, you're investing all over the world uh, with a big focus on emerging countries um, I'm interested to learn about Africa specifically uh, it, because you're a specialist in that uh, area. I know that you're involved with Fandela, uh, which was very interesting to see at uh, lunch um, today. So tell us a little bit about what is happening in Africa, what are some of the trends and what are you seeing? Yeah, no, Africa, I mean, we see Africa as the land of opportunity right now. Basically, some of the African countries are among the fastest growing in the world. I mean, there's uh, projections that say that population will expand from about 1 billion currently to about 2.4 billion by, two, by 2050. I mean, the, the, countries, the countries have the youngest population in the world. About 65% of the population is below 25 years of age. I mean, this opens, I mean, significant long-term possibilities, not only for the growth and development of the countries, but also for the, for the education space, and in particular for education uh, entrepreneurs to develop interesting models. I mean, we see that some of, the co some of the problems in Africa are very specific to the African continent. No, I mean, we've, uh, I mean, we've looked at, uh, you know, things that like low teacher accountability, low student attendance in, in, in the classroom, limited instructional time taking place in some of the 
of, 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 of the studies. I mean, uh, road learning is, is also a, a significant issue in, in, in some of the schools, uh, issues that have to do with poor infrastructure, I issues that have to, to do with girls' attendance to schools. I think there's, I mean, I think that entrepreneurs really have an opportunity to address some of these, some of these issues with very specific the type of business models. I, I, Africa is also the land of entrepreneurship. About 30, 30 to 35 of the uh, percent of the people aged 18 <laughs> to 65 years old are involved in any in, in some type of early stage entrepreneurial activity. That's the highest amount in in the world. Now, I mean, the, the key issue is uh, obviously formalizing this entrepreneurial activity and, and, and developing businesses that have the potential to scale up in a formalized way. I mean, we're starting to see some hotbeds of innovation in, in, in Africa. I mean, I was thinking about uh, Nigeria, uh, Lagos, I mean, Java neighborhood where there's definitely a number of uh, startups growing. I mean, things, uh, places like Nairobi, places like Joburg and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, we're very interested in, in investing as, 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 as a global investor in, in, in Africa education. We've completed a couple of, of investments in the earliest stage space. One of them is Andela. Andela, as, as, as you know, is, 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 is trying to leverage a global arbitrage in the skills, in the skills, in the skills offering by matching uh, top talent among the top 1% in, 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 African, in, 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 in the African market with, with uh, companies that are offering uh, coding jobs in the US and, and in other parts of the world. I think we think it's a great example. It's a talent as a service type of model that has you know, definitely potential to, to, to showcase how, how, African, uh, how African talent can be, can be very useful to the rest of the world. I mean, we also also investors into Bridge <coughs> International Academies. It's the largest uh, low cost network of, of K through 12, typically nursery and primary, and primary offering in, in, in initially in, in Kenya, but expanding into Nigeria, Uganda, and, and even uh, in, into other geographies outside Africa. I mean, we, we believe it. I mean, that there's potential for low cost models to really address some of the issues that we're seeing. I mean, the issue of low teacher accountability is really at the heart of what Bridge is trying to do, making sure that at least uh, children are exposed to 50 min to full lessons, 50 minutes with the teacher in the classroom. I mean, through a scripted curriculum that can help, uh, that can help, uh, you know, ensure that there's, uh, I mean, that there's a uh, high level of instructional time. I mean, that's one of the core issues that has been <coughs> highlighted in many of the World Bank reports and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So again, we, we see opportunity. We see already nascent activity. We like the companies that we're meeting. Spire is another excellent example of this that I think was presenting also here at the, at the conference. And, 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 and we, are, we are here to support, basically. Yeah. And, and the affordability question, that's something, Michael, maybe you can um, uh, talk about this. You know, th there are obviously different structures uh, in terms of education and how it's provided. There's obviously sure. the very expensive one, high-end yeah. universities in the U.S. that just a very small percentage can afford, and there's the kind of broader mass mm -hmm. services. And then, you know, to, to what Alejandro is saying, yeah. the, you know, the one that's for the lowest income people in places like Africa, South America, so in, in Asia as well. Mm -hmm. How do you see, what is the most interesting area? Uh, where do you focus on? Where could innovation really drive big success, success stories? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, Alejandro, it seems we have portfolio overlap. Yeah. Uh, we're investors in Andela and Bridge as well. Um, must be great companies. Um, so, uh, you know, if you read the kind of textbooks or, or assigned readings on disruptive innovation, Clayton Christensen's innovator's dilemma and innovator's solution. Uh, you know, he talks about how, you know, essentially you have to create new markets at, at the bottom. Uh, people that don't have any access before you introduce your, your just good enough service, right? Um, and then you gain market share and then you create a business model that can disrupt the incumbents. And, you know, we're seeing those kinds of uh, uh, kind of market entries happen, particularly with mobile phones. Uh, in emerging markets, serving the bottom billion. Uh, we're also seeing low-cost schools. Uh, uh, Bridge International obviously is paving the way, but uh, Pearson Affordable Learning Fund is, is out there finding a lot more all over the world. Um, but disruptive innovation doesn't really explain like Tesla, right? I mean, 
Tesla's not really creating access to transportation for the bottom billion. Um, and so I, I kind of had to think about this case study for a while. And then there's, there's another assigned reading in, in business school called Blue Ocean Strategy. And it talks about value innovation, right? And I think that um, the, the best innovations are either coming from the very top or the very bottom. And, and at the very top, what you have are extremely dissatisfied people that are aware of better possibilities and are dissatisfied with the educational options that they're seeing. And so, uh, you know, we've backed companies like Minerva, which is building, you know, the university of the future, uh, Andela, which is uh, only addressing the, the top, top, top talent and serving uh, certain companies that are willing to pay top dollar for top talent. Um, and we've invested in Alt School, which is a, um, a right now it's a network of seven campuses, but they, they plan to grow very quickly. Uh, but it's a $20,000 a year private school, uh, and it's aimed at families you know, in their 30s and 40s who uh, use technology and, and look at school. You know, they saw the Ken Robinson video, the number one TED talk, why is school still the industrial model and they want something different. And so, um, you know, we're really most attracted to these innovations at either the high end of the market or at the extreme kind of low end of the market um, because they're real entry points there. And um, most, most entrepreneurship fails because they don't find a really good entry point, not because it's a bad idea. Um, Though in, in the middle, you also see, um, in kind of like uh, middle income families, you also do see this rise in the ability and willingness to pay for services. So it's not that there aren't businesses there, as much as, as, much as um, we, we seem to see the innovations happening at the, at the high end or the low end that get the scale the most quickly. Well, and another company which we're all investors in is Coursera, which kind of, of seems course. to be targeting that middle class. Yes. And it's, you know, it's obviously the problem with um, high tuition rates. Uh, it's kind of directly against that and providing access, democratizing well, access to... Kind of, but I mean, a lot of their users are uh, generally already educated, but um, uh, low income, uh, folks in low income countries that want access to this kind of learning and otherwise wouldn't have access. So it is kind of a disruptive innovation in that regard. But then on the other side, in a weird way, it's kind of value innovation to universities who then can have another revenue stream by leveraging their brand. So they're kind of serving high-end universities and <laughs> consumers yeah. that are locked out of the market. So I would like to echo Michael's point. I totally agree. And that basically has taken us back to the business fundamentals. So whatever sort of business plan you're building, you know, the sort of uh, technology you adopt, you know, at the end of the day, you have to make sure that you know, things you do basically meet you know, those business fundamentals, those common sense things, make it sustainable and deliver results. I think delivering results is very important for running a sustainable education business. So what mm -hmm. sort of results you actually design, you know, your purpose for in the beginning. Yeah. And, and I how, can, oh, sorry. And how you're gonna mobilize all the resources, you know, or things that you do, you know, you have, you know, and to, or to deliver that result in the most effective way. And I, I, when I was trying to dissect this value innovation concept, I came up with the three Ds, right? You need to be addressing customers that are either dissatisfied, disengaged, or disenfranchised, right? And if you're not addressing one of those three, you're going to have a challenge, uh, you know, finding a good path to market. Yeah. So some of the, uh, you know, sort of, sort of uh, uh, the things I have, you know, I've been sort of investing, you know, in recent half a year. So I've seen about a, like 200 or 300 sort of projects. You know, some actually are not designed to be a sustainable business. So they are basically away from those, <laughs> those fundamentals. You know? So mm -hmm. when, when you're not having all those fundamentals actually being built into your business model, and I think you know, uh, problems will happen. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like to maybe go back to the, to the point that, that was raised by, by Michael for Coursera. I think uh, lifelong learning and, and adult learning is a key opportunity in emerging markets. I mean, we're starting to see how for Coursera a significant part of the user base are actually lifelong learners that want to benefit from, from this. I think in Brazil, some of the higher education players that are listed companies have addressed the, the working adult market very, very effectively, and that's also a very very interesting segment. We see for Latin America as a whole that the actual number of payers for, for education is increasing because Latin America has the highest working population in the world in relative terms. I think the, rate, the dependency ratio, I mean, children and seniors to working population is among the, among the lowest of the world. So that 
sort of demographic dividend that we're starting to see in many emerging markets is a huge opportunity to start looking at segments that the US market addressed long time ago, like, like that of, the, of adults. No? So, I mean, I do see a lot of, a lot of interest in, in models like Coursera expanding into emerging markets, but also some of the existing players in, in emerging markets actually opening up into these new segments. And we're starting to see a lot of that in higher education. I'm sure Rodrigo can, can speak to that as well. No? Yeah. And th if I could riff off that, um, uh, one of the great things about being in uh, education and learning is uh, it, it has what we call a compound demand effect, right? Uh, so the more educated someone is, the more they demand education. Uh, Tesla is a great company, but you only need one car, right? Whereas we're seeing that a lot of the demand for Coursera courses are, are coming from people that already have uh, a bachelor's degree, right? And the, the families that demand uh, supplemental services for their children or new types of schools for their children tend to be more educated. So, you know, as we continue to grow the amount of learning in the world, uh, this isn't going to be satiated. It create that's why it's, you know, uh, it's not the filling of a bucket or the filling of a pail, it's a lighting of a fire, right? So a lot of the work that we're doing is actually lighting a flame that's going to create even more demand around the world as we continue to grow our organizations. Yeah. I'd like to also go back a little bit to a situation in Brazil with, with Rodrigo. And I found, I mean, for us as an investor, obviously, the, I mean, the situation is challenging and we, we need to be looking very carefully at the market. We have high exposure to Brazil. We've invested in a number of, of, of education companies there. But also, the, I mean, the new context is opening opportunities as well. I just would like to talk about one of our portfolio companies, Ideal Investi which is, uh, which is uh, providing student loans to, to students to attend higher education institutions in the country. Well, I mean, all the, all the changes to the, to the FIES regulatory scheme and basically the student, lending, the student lending regulations in the country, which has constrained a little bit the supply of, of student loans, has actually been a positive development for, for Ideal Invest because the government is restricting student lending and a private provider can come in and, and offer offer student loans in, in a much more aggressive way that they were doing before. So, so I think there's obviously challenges. There's definitely opportunities. We as an investor remain quite interested in Brazil. We think that the long-term fundamentals are, are there. I mean, the low penetration levels in higher education. I mean, the need, the need for some of the large players to have an ecosystem around them that will help entrepreneurial activity and, and entrepreneurial companies to, to provide goods and services. I mean, we think all that, if you have a long-term horizon to the investment in, in, in education in Brazil, that remains. Obviously, there are short-term and medium-term challenges that make, it, uh, make everybody feel a little bit unease, and, and we need to look at, at, at that very carefully. But, but we do remain uh, as strong believers in the long term. No, sure. Education in Brazil, it's a huge market. I mean, you see Croton, Stasi, Somos, they're billion, billion dollar companies. Croton has over one million college students, one million in one group. Stasi over 500,000. So it's a huge market that has created very, very valuable companies, and that won't change. We're just seeing more opportunities for startups to enter and also get their share in this market. So basically, from the China perspective, you know, I see a lot of similarity between China and Brazil. But you, you are better off, you know. Basically, I have never cast a vote, you know, in my life. So our our president actually is appointed, you know. At least you are elected. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so if if I were going to, you know, like my company is, is actually is that, you know on the course to be international. So, do you advise, you know, us to? go Brazil and how we do that, if so? I mean, we're seeing many groups going to Brazil. We're talking about Apollo, De Vrij, many yeah. of them. So yeah. um, we've been seeing some of them, most of them are entering by M&A, you know, getting right. a small um, college and then starting to scale it. Um, online education in Brazil, distance learning has been crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, almost 50% of students, if they're not distance learners, they have at least one course, mm -hmm. which is in, in the internet. So. Um, Huge market, huge opportunities, just got to adapt to the crisis and survive for a while. Yeah, and also right. entrepreneurial activity has been very, very significant. I remember this, this, this work, this analysis that, that was done on, on actual entrepreneurship in Brazil, and more than 50 early stage companies were identified by 
by one of the leading foundations in the country. So, so I think, uh, I mean, it, this is a reality. I mean, there's more and more entrepreneurial activities, obviously. Uh, I mean, a number of them are, are, are trying to, to leverage funding and are trying to, to grow in, 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 in the space. But we do see, I mean, we do see opportunities for, 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 for early stage activity in Brazil and in other countries in the, in the Latin America region as well. Yeah. Um, one trend that I'm seeing is, especially in the K-12 uh, space, a lot of um, popular companies, uh, startups, uh, you know, student applications, student uh, services that suddenly start to build huge user bases with significant growth but they're still trying to figure out what their pricing model should be, how to monetize. Um, so one, maybe Rodrigo and Jack, uh, you can uh, briefly tell about how you monetize and then also talk about, you know, how, I mean, the incentive obviously for, for entrepreneurs and, and these people who create these companies have to be there that this is gonna be a real business over time. Uh, and especially so in the K-12 space, I mean, what, does, what has to happen for that that to become a reality yeah I'm not a really big believer in a freemium you know business model so I think that if you offer some service really elevating value adding and then you should actually charge a fee you know so your customers should be paying for exactly you know the sort of result you deliver so uh, you know China is very very competitive you know a lot of the uh, the things are actually for free so taking one of my uh, you know sort of a small team you know under you know, uh, under my management, actually seven people, 70 people team, have been around for, you know, more than 15 years. And they are actually a B2B business model. They're selling the subject-based, you know, uh, English language, you know, complementary online learning services to schools and for the fee. All right, so uh, they are covering more than 3,000 public schools right now. You know, th so the annual profit, you know, this year they forecast about a, at least 10 million US dollars. You know, so that's the sort of impact you know, it's designed to actually, you know, uh, to, to provide a sustainable, you know, business, but at the same time, over time, deliver results and then accept it by the marketplace. So I, I, I myself really do not like a B2B business model, but free B2B business model. I think that really sucks. All right. Yeah, and, and they're not, <laughs> I, I'm sure. Right. I don't not. know how this survive, you know, this survive among, you know, venture capitalists, but, or, you know, I don't know how it survive, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, and on the B2B side, they're definitely, I mean, they're not yeah. that many, but on the B2C side, they're a bunch of them, I mean, Remind, you know, Kahoot. Yeah, premium on the B2C side, I think it's fine, but uh, eventually, you know, the founder will figure out, you know, how to, or, you know, get a revenue going. But again, you know, for certain startups, actually designed, you know, from the right start, a B2B business <laughs> model, but it's free. I think it's really, I, I am not that smart to figure out, you know, how they generate you yeah. know, revenue. So we're an example of a freemium B2C company. And basically, <laughs> <laughs> we're B2C anyway. Um, so um, we raised our, we finalized our Series B in September of last year. Until the Series A, the entire focus of the company was in product and user growth. We had nothing, no initiatives to monetize, and we were able to build a user base of millions of users. Then we raised Series B. Okay, how are we going to monetize this? And our strategy basically has been um, to maintain the free platform, which is what provides our growth. We're, we literally didn't spend any cent in advertisement. All our growth was viral and organic, and that's because of the premium model. It, it's what keeps us growing. Um, and we're doing something similar to what Netflix does um, in generating content. Uh, we're basically investing a lot in big data, data science, gathering all the metrics of students. So millions of students sharing millions of materials and consuming millions and millions of these materials. And we're seeing the areas where we have the hugest bottlenecks, where users are having the hardest time and where, where we have least materials to help them. And now the, step, the second step of this company now is to get these metrics and build great content for these guys because we know where exactly they're feeling the pain. So that's how we're monetizing. Mm -hmm. I think there's also, I mean, a discussion when it comes to, to managing a, a business in emerging markets between the B2C and the B2B dilemma, no? which is a slightly different. Maybe Brazil is, is different and, and there's very, very interesting B2C models in Brazil, maybe because the ecosystem for venture capital is much more advanced in Brazil than it is in other emerging markets around the world. But when it comes to other markets, I mean, there's typically a difficulty. And, and I've had this discussion with many CEOs that come to me, what do you advise? Should I, 
shall I go B2C or shall I go B2B? And in many cases, they're afraid of going B2C because they're not, I mean, they're not certain that there will be the next uh, round of financing available for them in order to be able to really wait and then develop the user base in order to monetize at a later stage. So they need to start monetizing much earlier. And, and, and again, this is a typical discussion in many developing countries, emerging markets, maybe not so much in those where there starts to be availability of, of venture capital, which obviously that's the, I, I understand the case of Brazil. No? That's perfect. I mean, um, in B2C, normally you have to have scale, right? And in Brazil, we were the second company in history that was able to raise a Series B without having revenue. So that's why many companies can do it, because they can't focus on user growth in Series A because they're not even able to raise a Series A, and they won't be able to raise a Series B if they don't focus on revenue since they won. That's the reality of Brazil. So China has changed a lot, you know, from the investment sort of, uh, you know, world. So people are looking at, you know, balance between the user growth and the revenue. So mm -hmm. you have designed a path actually to a certain degree of revenue. And so we're, we have a joke, you know, basically there's three pitfalls, you know, for venture capitalists. One is free B2B, the other one's O2O, <laughs> the other one actually one-on-one -on -one tutorial online. So, so basically, people having doubt over you know the sustainability, you know, of the uh, whether you are able to generate revenue, enough revenue, you know, in the end or not. So, I, I think s to some extent that doubt is is valid, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. To to defend some of these uh, uh, market aggregating companies here. Uh, so, I mean, venture capital is here for a reason, and that's because uh, companies need runway to be able to achieve their goals, right? And uh, a lot of these precision products that I was talking to, uh, uh, talking about earlier, um, you know, they're solving a very narrow problem, but they can get a really wide audience really, really quickly, and they can do so at very, very, very low costs, and they can achieve network effects with their businesses that are really, really challenging to reproduce and really, really even more challenging to kind of unseat, right? And of course, you know, when you do raise venture capital and you, you are growing your business, at some point, your spreadsheets need to work, right? Your, your business needs to fit into an Excel spreadsheet that makes sense to the next set of investors, right? Um, as long as you're working with early stage venture capital, we understand that we're funding runway and that the Excel spreadsheets are um, all made up. And that's <laughs> totally fine. Um, but you know, so some of our teams, I mean, th as an extreme example, you know, we, we just looked at a team that had eight people and we're reaching five million monthly uniques and had 25 million downloads. Uh, you know, we have a team somewhere in the room here that, uh, that is still relatively small, uh, uh, works out of Eastern Europe uh, and uh, has you know, monthly uniques in the you know, 40, 40, 50 million range, right? And so you start to build these really big audiences. And so then when you start to think about revenue models, and, and education is sensitive because you, you can't just pull a Facebook and, and no. blast banner ads, right? Yeah. Um, but they have what we call distribution control, right? And um, if, you, if you start to run the spreadsheets and you say, OK, well, even if you had like 2% conversion, which is, would actually be low on anything by standard internet terms, right? If you're reaching this large of an audience, uh, the, the, the revenue ramp can get big quick, right? Um, that's not to say that there aren't companies that are struggling to figure out wh how that needs to work or how to get people to, to buy what kind of productization or upsell or go from B to C to B, right? There have been some challenges with that. But, um, but I, I mean, in defense of that, if, if you're in venture capital, you're, you're, you're here for big outcomes because the numbers really only work in BC if some of your companies like return the entire fund. And in order to return the entire fund, they need to get big and they need to get big fast. And so you can kind of play this waiting game and let teams figure it out. And hopefully they stay lean and capital efficient. So if they stay lean and capital efficient, generally you're in, you're in a good spot, right? But if they ramp team and ramp cost, sometimes it can get a little, um, yeah. the wheels can fall off the bus, you know? Tim Draper once said, if I invest in 10 companies and nine of them don't go bankrupt, then I'm not investing enough. So mm, yes. that's right. correctly the case. Um, a lot of the discussion here at the summit, at the keynotes, was around how um, you know, we're getting into this um, period of fast innovation. Jobs are getting serried, you know, taken over by machines. 
Um, so what will need to happen um, in the education space in order to prepare the new generation, which I call the snap generation, um, uh, you know, to, to kind of get prepared for what's going to be there in 5, 10, 15 years? And, you know, what, is, what are your opinions? Well, I think if, if we see the trend in, in, in the U.S. in terms of the type of tasks <coughs> and, and that are being done in the labor market, I mean, we see a growth basically in two dimensions. One is anything that has to do with problem solving, I mean, as a skill. And the second area that has grown significantly is interpersonal communication, things that have to do with complex interaction among people. And, and I mean, there's what, there was this analysis by Dick Murnane at Harvard University. He started looking at this in 1960, and until 2002, there was significant growth in these two type of tasks over time. And we're starting to see the same trend in some of the analysis that the World Bank has done, for instance, in Brazil. So my, I, I think my, my take at this is that achieving the right combination of cognitive and non-cognitive skills in the education system and in particular you know being able to work all these cross-cutting skills leadership teamwork creativity communication and so on and so forth i think becomes a critical critical element i'm sure there's uh, business models to be done around around this but but i think if we want to get people ready for the jobs of the future which <coughs> haven't even been invented i mean Definitely, in particular, in, 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 in emerging markets, these are some of the areas that need to be worked on very carefully. I mean, if you think about it, what you just said, you're preparing kids for jobs that haven't been invented, and how, who, how do you select the right teachers then? Because obviously, teachers need to be able to <coughs> teach <coughs> students for something that's not there yet. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a challenge, I think, going from a teacher-centric <coughs> to more of a learner-centric approach is, is sort of at the, at the core of what, what needs to happen. I, I don't think I have the, the, I mean, the silver <coughs> ballot, but, but def definitely I think there's a lot of professional development that needs to take place. I mean, there's work that needs to happen around, around uh, changing the, the curriculum in, 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 a, in a number of countries and making sure there's curricula that, that is more aligned with, with some of these uh, cross-cutting skills and the development of these skills. And I would, I would try to, 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 to definitely start with selecting the best to the teaching profession. I think in some countries like China, I mean, teachers have uh, some, some status in society. I think that's a critical element. And, and uh, we've seen policies <coughs> in countries like Singapore and other countries around the world where there's a lot of interest in attracting the best and selecting the best to the teaching profession. That's potentially one policy angle to it. Yeah. I like that comment a lot. You know, I, I have a concept called the fundamental education, you know, elements. You know, together, you know, they form the learning circle. So, from from relatively long term perspective, you focus on building a content. You know, whatever happens, the content will not go away. You know, good teachers, and you know, trying to or in a, you know, if you're in a certain set of business, you want to select the best possible students. You know, and you want to design a learning space that is stimulating, motivating, and effective. And uh, you wanted to try to invest in uh, you know certain platform or technology tools to make sure that you could uh, utilize the best possible education resources in a more effective and efficient way. So I, I mean those elements will not go away. Whatever happens. Well, um, look, no, none of us are farmers, or at least I don't think we're going back to our farms here here at the end of the conference, uh, and we're probably not going back to our factory jobs either. <coughs> so, you know, our economies have made these kind of transitions before, and I think there's, there's, there's been a lot of worry in the past about this, but somehow, you know, through the markets have kind of sorted themselves out over time, obviously with, with significant structural challenges at times and in places. Um, so, and, and it's really hard to predict. Uh, yesterday in DC, Gene Sperling, who is uh, Obama's economic advisor, uh, he said in 1993 in the Clinton administration, a bunch of really smart people from the Department of Labor were trying to figure out what would be the most growth jobs, right? the, the jobs that would be growing the fastest. And they predicted in 1993 that the most rapidly growing career for the next decade would be travel agents. Um, and so you know, these, uh, they were looking at trends in travel and globalization and internationalization. They just didn't understand that people wanted to click a button on a uh, kayak. right? Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's impossible for us to predict, but I do think that um, there's certainly enough conversation and, and new programs coming out and new startups coming out 
addressing these 21st century skills. One of the things I see missing from these uh, uh, that I think is a core skill is actually trust building, right? Because um, if you think of like, well, why are we here today? We've got um, four people from around the world, five people from around the world, all from different places, you know, and we're sitting here together trying to figure out ways to work together and ways that we can, we can benefit one another. And that just comes from our ability to generate trust. And like the world right now is able to generate a lot more trust now than we have since <coughs> like ever. And, and I think that that's a skill that we, we need to include in the 21st century skills as well. Yeah. Great. Well, we're out of time. So thank you, everyone, for your participation. This was great. And thank you. Thanks.